Wednesday. This is Michelle Quay. I am a confidence and leadership coach. And today, welcome to Live Coffee Talk. Today, I am super excited because one of the big value that I have in life is connection. And during the pandemic, I made a number of very meaningful connections. And this is a person that I have connected and I'm very grateful that I have made the connection. Um, so joining me, please. Um, today, I have a very special guest from he is the founder and president of Raw, um, Gary Schneeberger. Bravo, you got it exactly right. So many people don't, most people don't even try it. Most people are like, Mr. Gary, they, they just don't know how to go. So bravo, Schneeberger, <laughs> way to go, Michelle. We're starting <laughs> off on you. a- we're starting off on a great note. So well, thank you. I wanted to make sure that I pronounced it correctly. So so initially I was pronouncing it a Gary Schnee Schneeberger. And that's no. acceptable too. Um, but uh, apparently the the two E's uh, in German are in A Y and it actually mm -hmm. means Schnee, S E H N E E means snow in German. So my name means man who lives on a snowy hill. And I'm in the state of Wisconsin, so I do indeed, in, at certain months of the year, live on a snowy hill. Mm, yeah, so, so we'll, we'll talk more about Wisconsin. Yes. So, <laughs> Gary draws his uh, executive experience and execution acumen in entertainment, ministry, and media to help individuals and organizations engage audience with the boldness and create creative clarity that ensures that they are heard. So in the most simple word, um, I can't I can say it without showing you what it looks like. So basically, he is the author of this book. I know you. I have virtual background. So yes, I don't. So, so, so there's there it is. Oh, but I have sunlight coming in the window. There you go. Bite the dog. Yeah. And the, and the short version of that. Um, I mean, I, I got to get a PR guy besides me to write that intro. It's like, oh, my gosh. Um, uh, the bottom line, the short version, the 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 Cliff's Notes version is I'm a PR guy. That's what I do. I'm in public relations. So he, I he's help. a PR guy. Right. That's, that's what I do. So that's, that's the quickest way to get from point A to point B. <laughs> I love how you are just jumping around from point A to point B. So, so <laughs> tell us about the point A to point B, because I think that's what people wanted to know. And, and today, um, I kinda, you have a long list of experience going from uh, being a journalist at the New York Times. You were on the New York Times, LA Times. Uh, USA Today, Times Square Illustration, NPR to B BBC, basically all the TV and cable network you've been on. And you have a lot of experience, 15 years experience in newspaper from coast to coast. So mm -hmm. long list of experience, but I wanted to kind of narrow down to um, where you were, because you came from Wisconsin. Yeah, then I, you left Wisconsin. Correct. Now I'm back in Wisconsin. So what was full that all circle. About? Yeah, the, I mean, I started my newspaper career um, in the late 80s in a city not far from where I live in, Ken I mean, where I grew up in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So I started in a city called Racine. And that was, that was my first newspapering job. And uh, at the time when newspapers were still kind of robust, uh, and, they, and they have unfortunately uh, become less so now. There are papers that are, have gone out of business and they've limited how many days a week they publish. But um, one of the ways that you, that you stayed on track and grew in your career in newspapering was to move on every couple of years to another job in another city. So that's what my life was like in my newspaper career. Left Wisconsin, moved to Iowa, uh, moved to Texas. I, I kept taking new jobs and new markets every two and a half years or so to move up the chain, uh, to get promoted, to become an editor, do those kinds of things. Um, then in the early 2000s, my newspaper career ended and I took a job with uh, a nonprofit um, organization where I got into public relations there. So the difference was, I, I wasn't, actually I wasn't trained in journalism either. I just did it, I learned it as I went. Um, but my, my degree was in English, which I used to laugh, you know, didn't really qualify me to do anything except talk with an accent, right? <laughs> but but um, I, I worked as a journalist in college. I was editor of my school newspaper. Um, I worked um, for a local publication here in my hometown. 
uh, which is like a TV guide sort of magazine that's free. And I did celebrity interviews and TV reviews. And I got experience, which then led me to get more experience. And I moved up, kept doing journalism, and then left journalism in 2000 to work at this nonprofit where I got into public relations. So the idea there was I never got trained in public relations per se, but I knew what it was like to be on the other side of the questions. I dealt with public relations people all the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I jokingly say that the great thing about public relations is, and I've spent about equal times in both things, journalism and public relations, I've spent about 15 years in each. The great thing about PR is I get to work with journalists all the time, but I don't have to get paid like a journalist. So that's a really cool thing. <laughs> And, and I think in the book, you know, in the beginning of the book, you talked about um, how you, when, when it, it's really important to get a headline uh, in PR, right? And, and this is where that, that title, Bite the Dog, came yep. around. Yep. And, and I thought that was just brilliant because I was, when I got the book, I was in the beginning of understanding what it takes to do the PR and, and what advantage it would it be to actually do the PR so your book actually gave me great insight and I really well, appreciated it and that, I have this I have I got a sign by the way by the folks <laughs> and I've I've got a signed one of yours too so that's that's worked out fabulously for us but how I got back to Wisconsin so I left the nonprofit to go work in Hollywood and I worked for three years in Los Angeles doing publicity doing public relations for the film industry and um, after three years um, in 2016, through, the, through Facebook, which we're connected on Facebook, which is great. I have some things I wanna tell your, your viewers about what I think about you on Facebook and how, how inspirational you are, but we'll get to that in a minute. On Facebook, one of the things I've done through the years, because my career in journalism took me through so many cities and so many publications that every now and then if I was bored, I would go and I'd go on my computer and I'd go, hey, I wonder whatever happened to Joe Smith, who was in the newsroom with me when I worked in Iowa. And I'd find Joe Smith on Facebook and I'd be like, hey, Joe, how you doing? So I would just do that periodically. And on, uh, on February 13th in, on tw in 2016, a name popped in my head from college when I was editor of my college newspaper. There was a there was a uh, uh, woman, a uh, girl at the time, she was 17. I had recruited from high school in the region to come work for me at, at the newspaper when I was editor in college. And she was very talented, so good in fact, that I promoted her to be an editor, an assistant news editor within like a couple of months. Very talented reporter, passionate, aggressive, good journalist. I graduated that year and when I left, um, I'm, I'm a sentimental kind of guy. And I, 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 I was a pen snob then, but I didn't have the money to actually be a snob. So I had like a Parker pen, a cheap Parker pen. But it was, what, it was my daily pen. And what I did when I graduated is I wanted to encourage her in her writing career. So I gave her the pen uh, to say, you know, go pursue your goals. She was a freshman. I was, I was leaving, gave her the pen. And then said goodbye, gave her a hug. We were just friends. 30 years later, I hadn't talked to her for 30 years. One day on Facebook, February 13th, 2016, I type in the name and find her. Say, hey, how you doing? Can this really be the, the, the ace journalist from our days at the University of Wisconsin Parkside? And she wrote back in 12 minutes, and it was indeed her. And um, long story made short, uh, we discovered we were still friends, uh, that, 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 that connection that we had as friends was still there, but we discovered that more was there as well. Uh, she, had never she had never left Wisconsin, never left the area that we were in college. Um, so we discovered that we, uh, we, we fell in love quickly through the same way that we, that we originally connected, through typing words back and forth on Facebook. And uh, that was enough to have me leave Hollywood and move back home after 27 years away so I could marry, not my college sweetheart, but the first, the first person I ever tried to mentor professionally. Um, and we've been married now for a little over three years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. I'll, I'll, I'll say to people, you know, what makes a guy at age 51 leave Hollywood to move back home to his hometown in Wisconsin after 27 years? What on earth could make a guy do that? 
only what, one what, thing. What, what was going through your head in the moment? Like, it, was it just love? Was it love? Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, and that's a great question, Michelle, what was going through my head, one of the things Hollywood taught me, and if you think about this in movies, this is true. All movies have three acts, act one, act two, act three. Act three is the last third of the film, and that's where, you know, the big conflict happens. That's where the climax happens. That's where, depending on your movie, you're going to get a happy ending. And I was at that time, age 51. If you take the average life expectancy, I was at the start of the third act of my life. And I wanted the third act of my life not to be, you know, like the middle half of my life, or maybe it wasn't as exciting as it could have been. I wanted it to be the best act of my life. I wanted it to be the most exciting with the happiest ending. And I knew if that was going to happen, this was the happiness train. Kelly is, is my wife. Uh, Kelly was there coming by and I needed to get on that train. So I had already started my own company, Roar, uh, my own PR company. And I just, you know, I can do what I do from anywhere. So I still do some things for the film industry, but I was able to come back home, um, get married and still, you know, keep my business going, which is, you know, it's been going on um, uh, more than four years now. So yeah, what was going through my head was, it's the third act of my life. I've worked on enough movies to know that the third act is the exciting, this is where all the, all the excitement and the, and the glory and the fun, and yeah, there's a little bit of danger involved. There's a little bit of conflict involved, but it's the happy ending time. And that's what I chased and that's what I got. So, so what, what made you decide your act one and act two wasn't doing it for you? Like, like at what point did you decide, you know, act three is where I wanted to be and I want this to be a happy ending? Yeah, I was, um, I was in a, um, I was, I'd been married for a long time um, and there were some issues in the marriage, some problems in the marriage. Um, I have, I'll say this, my former wife and I have, have patched all those things up and become friendly and that's great. Um, but I, what my life was like at that time was, is that all there is? Is this all there is? Is the best I can hope for, this is not terrible, but it's not wonderful. It's just kind of here. Um, and I did not want that to be, that was the second act of, of, of my life personally. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted something to have a little bit more adventure, right? That's, that's, that's what happens in the third act of movies. It's the big adventure. Um, uh, it's, 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 the, it's the climax. It's the, it's the, big, uh, the big battle scene. It's the big uh, you know, romantic scene. That's what I wanted to get. Um, and I knew that this was my opportunity. There was a reason why after 30 years of not thinking a bit about Kelly McKissick, the young girl I, I, I recruited from college to come work for me on the college newspaper. When we were just kids playing newspaper in college. We were friends. For her to pop in, for us to still have a connection as friends and watch that develop over the course of, I mean, it was nine days. In, in, in nine days of, of exchanging messages on Facebook, I was convinced. I knew. I wasn't even convinced. I mean, uh, there's a line I, I wrote one time in a piece of, a short piece of fiction I, I, mm -hmm. I wrote that said, I hadn't thought about it again until right now. And the line was, when you know, it doesn't matter what you think. And I just knew. It didn't matter what I thought was smart, right, wrong. You know, mm -hmm. why leave Hollywood to go back to Kenosha, Wisconsin? Who does that? Um, how, how do you start a business or keep a business afloat that you just started that does works in, in Hollywood? How do you do that from the Midwest? None of that stuff mattered. I'm an, I, I'm an hour fr from Chicago and an hour from Milwaukee, less than an hour. I'm in a good spot for the business mm -hmm. that I have. That worked out great. So yeah, it, it, it was a, I knew in my heart that's where I needed to go. And it didn't matter all the things in my head that were telling me, are you mm -hmm. nuts? I wasn't mm -hmm. nuts. <laughs> so, so what I'm hearing, what I, what I heard was that you kind of just follow your heart. And, and I think without too much thinking, you just follow your heart. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, I had done too much thinking. I had done too much um, color within the lines. Act two of my life was color within the lines. Mm -hmm. I'm having a fun time grabbing the crayon and just scrawling all over the place because that's what we're doing. And, I, and, you know, I just, I had no, I have no biological children. Mm -hmm. 
I now have the enormous blessing. Kelly has two kids, um, uh, Hunter and Alyssa. Uh, I have two fantastic stepchildren. Just, I mean, it's- it, Hunter it, just graduated, right? Hunter just graduated and, and Alyssa turned 20 yesterday. And, and it's, there's like, there, there's things that I've always wanted in my life, I now have, and a bunch of stuff I never knew I could want because you just don't know how that kind of, you know, adjusts your heart a little bit to have the day-to-day -day ability to help raise uh, someone into adulthood. It's, it's, a, it's a fabulous thing. Yeah, I missed out on the, on the early years, but this, these are important years and, and uh, not always easy, not always fun, but it is definitely third act stuff. It's exciting yeah, and rewarding. And rewarding. So, so um, I know this is something uh, very uh, trivia for um, the viewers because Gary, before we got onto the camera, Gary was telling me that he has a seven foot tall superhero in his room, his office. And so um, what comes up to my mind as we're talking about different acts is who was your villain in your journey? Who was my villain in my journey? Well, let me, before I answer that, can I share my screen? Of course, yes. I'm gonna show my seven foot tall uh, superhero uh, so people can see that there is Superman in uh, my office office. There he is seven feet tall in the background. Um, uh, he's wearing a headband for an event I promoted, but there you go. And there, and there you can see the Roar name right there as well on my, uh, on my uh, screen, but the, <laughs> The, Come up with that name, Roar. Well, let me share my screen again. See, I'm prepared. <laughs> um, the, uh, how that happened was uh, I, um, at church in Los Angeles, so I'm a Christian. I was at a church in Los Angeles where during the worship service, during the singing of, of uh, songs, there was an artist there who was painting um, a photograph, I, I, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, painting a painting. And when, uh, when it was over, this is what she painted, the, uh, what I'm about to share right here. Um, and I bought, that, I bought that painting, an original painting that she painted. And there's something about, you know, going back to where I said in act two of my life, it felt like I was living with my head, not my heart. There's something here about the way the lion is roaring, um, the, the, the colors and, and just the abandon with which He's or she, the, the, you know, the lion is saying, I, I want to be heard. Uh, I, I, my voice is going to be heard. This is what I wanted to do in my life. And that is what I wanted to give clients when I started the firm, the ability to do with their business, the, you know, authors, experts, speakers, coaches, consultants. I wanted them to be able to do this. And that the, the uh, underneath uh, you know, the, the brand promise, the slogan of Roar is be heard. That's what I try to offer people who I work with, the opportunity to be heard. It's noisy out there. Um, and, and I say, you know, sometimes it's okay to blow the other guy's hair back a little bit. And that lion right there, if you're standing in front of him, mm -hmm. it's going to blow your hair back a little bit. If you have hair. I don't have that problem, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> nothing's going to blow my hair back a little bit. But um, it, it, it's okay sometimes to, to be loud, to, to, to really make your point. And that's what I try to offer. And, and for me, when I saw that painting, I bought it immediately. And that became the organizing construct for what I wanted my business to be. I think it's so beautiful, that painting. I remember seeing it on your Facebook feed yeah. um, when I was going to, and you talked about it one day. And I thought... A, a lot of time, you know, we don't recognize that lion inside of us. We're walking around like a beaten dog and, and, and that's how we typically feel until one day it kind of, you start to get really fed up with all the things that you had to deal with in act two. And finally, one day you just decided, you know what, I want to be heard. And that lion, you know, what you just show, show it, it show me, it demonstrated that for me. Yeah. Now I never got around to answering your question. Bad. I'm a PR guy. I should answer. Well, actually, no, that's actually a good PR tactic. You don't have to answer the questions that people ask you. You can just talk, you know, you can go, well, that's a really interesting question, but, but I want to answer your question. What was the villain in my life as I was, uh, you know, I think the villain in my life was comfort. Um, 
I had gotten to a place where I was comfortable. I, I had, you know, we talked earlier about rising through the ranks of newspapers. I was a vice president. I was in, I had a corner office, uh, the head of communications for a large global organization. Um, and comfort, just kind of, comfort can kill uh, creativity, can kill passion, can kill a lot of that stuff. So for me, that was, uh, was my supervillain. And I was able to you know, moving back home from Los Angeles to your hometown of Wisconsin after 27 years, um, that that will knock comfort out the window a little bit. And yet there are comforts here, not just because Kelly still lived here, but, you know, I, I grew up uh, from single digits in a neighborhood full of, of boys who were largely raised by single mothers. They all still live here. They're all still friends. They're, bro they're, they're brothers to me. Um, and, and that having that kind of ability to fall back into that even though we're 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 not you know kids anymore by a by a long stretch that has helped sort of it, it, there that's a good kind of comfort because it's it, we're not just trading stories about our 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 glory days we're making new glory days and that's exciting mm -hmm. i think i i wanted to um kind of draw back to to be heard what does it mean to be heard you know it's a um and I, I didn't, I was going to get it before we started and I didn't get it. So I can't remember exactly everything it says on the back of my business card. I, well, in fact, you have it, grab the book and pull and read, read the line on the back of that business card. The bottom one that's in, that's in bold. It says raw delivers multi uh, generational multimedia solution to the greatest challenge face, facing communicators today. Unleashing a distinctive voice that breaks through the word, uh, the word noise around us to make a difference in the world around us. Break yeah. through the word noise. Right. The idea of being heard is that you break through the word noise that's around all of us, right? And we've talked a couple times about social media. There's a lot of word noise there. There's, there's, there's word noise around us, but to break through that, to make a difference in the world around us, that's what it means to be heard, to have somebody, there, there's nothing more rewarding for me than when a client gets an opportunity to, to have, a, have a media outlet um, do a story on him or her or it, if it's a, you know, a, a, a company, to have that story and, and, to, and to see the excitement of, I remember what it was like when I was a journalist just starting out and my first byline, I wrote something and my name was on there and people got to read it that I was heard, what I was writing was being heard. And that's the same thing that happens for clients today is they get a chance to get their message out there into the, into the marketplace of ideas and they get to sort of put their flag, you know, plant their flag in the ground of what they have to say. That to me is what it's like is to take what's in your heart and use it to change other people's hearts. That's the benefit of being heard. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of social media, I'm going to hijack for a second because there's something I told you beforehand. I wasn't going to tell you because I wanted to do it when we were live. Yeah. There's uh, one of the great things about you, Michelle, and social media, and people who are watching this know this already, is you are so um, positive. You are so energetic that when I look at your posts on Facebook, when I see the videos you shoot, I see the things that you do, your, your, your Friday night coffee, uh, I mean, not coffee, your Friday night open bar thing that you do virtually. Uh -huh. I look at all that, I cannot tell. You're the only person I'm friends with on Facebook. When I look at your newsfeed, I could not tell the circumstances we are in as a country right now, as a world right now. There's nothing in there that says this is a pandemic and and this is bad and this is bad and this is bad and politics is bad and this is bad and this po nothing is like it and it's not that you're ignoring it it's it's that you're celebrating all those things that we can still celebrate uh, you know I started um, stopped for a while started again looking for things every day that I can be grateful for what's my my daily dose of gratitude. Um, uh, you do that every day in the way that you post what you post and the things that you do. You're constantly looking on the bright side of things. And that's an extraordinary skill at a time when, you know, the, the sun can feel blotted out by a lot of what we deal with. So I wanted to thank you in front of your, your viewers for 
having a presence in social media that does not harp on walk in traffic with pandemic, not that you don't care about it, but that you don't, that's not, that doesn't define your existence right now. You're looking for things to be grateful for and to encourage other people with. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciated it. <laughs> I, I think it's a perspective, right? So mm -hmm. you and I, we, we, we all came through a journey where we decided, you know, act two is not my thing and we wanted to go to act three. It's not because we're neglecting or we're forgetting where we came from or right. what the struggle that we had to go through. It's just that we choose to focus on what's more important and meaningful for us. And we can continue to focus on our act two where we're struggling, where we don't find any fulfilling and purpose, or we can just look at life and, and realizing that there's so many other things that we can appreciate. Hunter, Kelly, the love that you surrounded yourself right. with, those yeah. are what matters now in this present moment. It's not your act two, all these uh, uh, things that you had experienced in the past. So, I mean, they are part of you, but you know, th those are not your present moment. This is not where we're at. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, it really is a, it's a perspective experience uh, of, you know, what, what are you going to focus on today? Yeah, you could focus on the fact that, you know, you, there's a pandemic and, and here's the news stories and, you know, arguing with people about, you know, this is that, and you don't do any of that. You, you're, you're encouraging people trying to, you know, uh, be insightful, even this sort of thing. I'm not sure I'm doing anything to encourage anybody, but just having these sorts of things that people can talk about and, and we can get away from that, st that constant inundation. We should be aware of what's going on around us, but at the same time, we should look for those things that we can be grateful for because, um, you know, I, I did a podcast uh, and there's a, there was a, a quote from somebody who said there was research done during World War II mm -hmm. that the longer residents of Britain survived the bombing by the German Luftwaffe the longer that they survived, they came to expect to survive. It was research done by Malcolm Gladwell, the author. Um, what a fascinating thing. The longer that you survive, you come to believe that you will survive. I want to apply that to my life going through the pandemic. The longer that we're able to, to have things in life that we can focus on and be grateful for, then we're going to expect to find that gratitude. That's, that, that's how I hope to you know, sort of ride out this this uncertain time mm -hmm. and speaking of gratitude you've been posting a lot of uh, things that you are grateful for every day and a lot of it has to do with your wife kelly and hunter mm -hmm. and also Alyssa. so if you were to say a few words to them what would that be mm. this is your uh, opportunity gary this is my <laughs> opportunity well i'm going to go back to um uh I mean, the first thing that popped in my head is that, you know, one of the, there's a song, uh, I'm a big Johnny Cash fan, it shows how old I am, but um, Johnny Cash had a song, it's called Rose of My Heart, and he sang it to his wife. And I, I, I that, was a, that was a song that Kelly and I danced to at our wedding. And Kelly, I mean, it says in my book that uh, I dedicate my book to Kelly as the rose of my heart, and that Hunter and Alyssa are the petals. Uh, because that is the truth. Um, there is, you know, uh, I, I say to the kids, they, they, I get upset with them because I fall down the stairs all the time because I don't see the step, right? As a step parent, I don't see the step. When I look at them, I don't, I don't see it. I understand it. They have a dad. I'm not trying to replace their dad. They know that. But in my heart, I don't see the step. Um, that's, that's the, I mean, they have uh, blossomed uh, things about me I never thought I'd ever get to experience and uh, a bunch of stuff I never knew I could experience. That's been the beauty of this. And to discover that when you thought in act two, that ship had sailed, you were never going to have a parenting experience in your life. To have that, what an enormous blessing that is. So that's, you know, Summarize one word for, for all three of them, blessing. And I'll add, 
one more person because uh, there's a young woman named Heather and we don't have time to get into the whole story, but Heather was a young girl I met. It's funny, I always tell the story, wait with me until I finish the sentence before you judge me. The 16 year old girl I met on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay, wait till I finish because that sounds creepy. It wasn't creepy. She was, she was, she was, um, I worked at this large nonprofit. She had started a, uh, she was 16 years old and she'd started a site to support the leader of this nonprofit who was a controversial figure in some quarters and culture. And I was his PR guy. So I reached out to the person who ran this page, having no idea who it was, mm -hmm. found out it was a 16 year old girl li who lived in International Falls, Minnesota, immediately said, let me talk to your mom. So nobody thinks I'm, I'm you know, and um, over the course of time, I, I came to know her and she had kind of grown up in a, in a difficult situation with her father. And uh, I became a bit of a, uh, of a father figure surrogate dad to her so much to the point that she blessed me immensely by asking me to walk her down the aisle when she got married ten, uh, nine years ago now. So uh, she was the first blossom of what that felt like. Heather was the first blossom of what it felt like to have parental feelings. And now I get to experience that every day. Um, she has, uh, you know, Heather has, uh, has three children. Uh, that's my experience of kind of getting to be uh, a, a grandpa. I'm, you know, I'm Grandpa Gary with uh, those wonderful kids, which is a fantastic thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just couldn't be happier. Again, that was a that was a, uh, a a second act experience, but it's really blossomed in the third act. I, I love it. Um, it's giving me goosebumps right now because what I'm hearing is it's not the title, it's not how much we have in our life, is what we can do to impact others. And and what I heard just now is you stepping into this stepfather figure but you don't see that step you don't see the title you're you're being there for Alisa, for hunter for even heather and i see your post about these um you know the things that you do with your family and i see a lot of love and i think one of the posts that i had shared um before we um to advertise all this is that i see a man who has a lot of love integrity and there's so many values in your life so it's not the title, it's not the accomplishment that you have made in the past. It's really about who you are and how you're doing everything. Well, that, that is extraordinarily kind. Uh, thank you for that. That's, that, you know, that, to hear that, that's more, you know, that, I mean, there's like, we talked about my book, there's a bunch of endorsements on the back of my book. That, that is great. But what you just said, again, because it, it, re it refers to the life I'm trying to lead, that is, uh, far more uh, meaningful to me. Uh, it, it, if I may, can I share my screen one more time since I talked about Heather? Of course. Um, all right, let me go here. So there I am when she got, doesn't she look like she's about 12? She, she was 19 <laughs> when she got married, but that was me walking her uh, down the aisle. That's at the, uh, before I handed her over to her fantastic husband, Jesse. So that was uh, truly uh, a, a, a wonderful moment. So again- You, you uh, look really nervous, Gary. I am, it's funny. We have a photo right before this, Michelle, where <laughs> I took like a selfie of us as we were about to go down. Heather looks like she's gonna pass out because she's so nervous. And mm -hmm. I'm like smiling like, hey, once we get down there, well, she gets a glimpse of her husband right? Who's going to be her husband in like five minutes. So she's all happy because she's looking at him. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to pass out because I'm all <laughs> emotional that again, something I never thought would ever happen for me, having no biological children. I had the honor of walking her down the aisle and giving her away to her, uh, to her husband. So that was uh, uh, a fabulous thing. And, and she named, she named her second son, Benjamin Gary. Oh. So all those, all those those years of, of not having children and thinking, I'm not going to have a legacy, right? There's this, there's this boy and, and he's got my, my, my name is his middle name. It's just a it, it, third act. Third act is great. Let me tell you, the third <laughs> act, the third act is great. So I kind of wanted to wrap up, but before I wrap up, you know, what came to my mind is that I know you are a man of faith. And what came to my mind is there's, there's always that saying that we hear in the church um, that talked about God will provide. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, 
hearing your story and, and knowing that, yeah, yes, you may not have any biological children, but God will provide. And Absolutely. that's exactly what he did. Absolutely. That is, um, that is well said. And I, I, that one of the things I'm grateful for is that, that, is that that happened. And there were many, and there were many times where I would, um, I would, I would pray, you know, earlier when it was still possible for me to have children, um, that it would happen that, that my wife at the time would change her mind about having children and she didn't. And that's, you know, that's her, you know, that's okay. Um, but that didn't happen. And I felt like that, you know, my faith probably wavered a bit when I said, I felt like that, that train had passed me by. Uh, but you're absolutely right. God brought Heather into my life. And then, you know, a few years after that, reconnecting with Kelly. And I mean, one of the greatest parts of reconnecting with Kelly was the, the first time she shared a picture of Hunter and Alyssa with me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I get a chance to come in and be, and be a stepfather. And um, uh, they are, uh, as I said, um, that I get mad at them all the time because I, you know, I fall down the stairs, I don't see the step. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I always ask um, my- I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. <laughs> If you were to give one word or to use one word to describe what the world needs, what do you think the world needs? I, I have a, I have a, uh, like show and tell. Uh, so, what show and tell? <laughs> so before I do it, is I, I've got to build up the story. This, this is, this is a, a um, the first dictionary that Noah Webster ever produced from 1828. And, it's a facsimile of it, obviously. I wouldn't be walking around with it if it was already that old, but um, he, he defines many of the words, most of the words in their, with their biblical meaning, which is, for, for me as a, as a Christian, that is, a, that is very, uh, helps me in my Bible reading. But this word I'm gonna give you that I think the world needs, he has 20 definitions in this dictionary from 1828. I'm gonna read you the first one. And that the word is grace. I think what we need in this world um, for each other mm -hmm. is, is certainly grace. I also believe what's helped me, uh, what's changed my life, saved my life and made it worth living uh, was God's grace to me. Um, but here's grace in a non-Christian um, uh, definition. This is how Noah Webster defined grace in 1828, his first dictionary favor, goodwill, kindness, disposition to oblige another as a grant made as an act of grace. This idea of putting others ahead of yourself, this idea of being kind to others and to oblige others. It's not about what I can get, it's about what I can give. That, uh, I think, uh, we see it play out on social media. That's Social media could use a lot of grace and social media reflects life. So I think that's the, that if we could all muster a little bit more grace for each other and for ourselves, I think we'd be in a better position. Hmm. I, I love the word race. And, and what also comes up for me is service. How can I be a service yep. for everyone? Yep. Yeah. And you do a great job of that. I, I see it all the time with all the things that you're offering people, the opportunity to connect Right. I mean, I look at right live coffee talk, love, courage, connection. You're offering love. You're 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 modeling courage, and you're and you're building connection. I mean, you're living your mission every moment of every day, and I see it on Facebook. So, bravo to you. <laughs> I get my inspiration from superheroes so so last thing last thing before we go you gotta right. you gotta turn your chair <laughs> oh yes okay so um just so the the uh, the uh, viewer knows before when we were chatting michelle asked me who my favorite superhero was and i said well i don't have to tell you i can show you so this is my home office that i'm in right now but here's here's i'm going to show you the back of my chair uh here in my home office I, I need to play the music on, you know, I should play, should have thought about that, the superhero. <laughs> yes. So 
my uh, my office office has a Batman uh, cape on the back of it. So, um, as I said, one of the great things, one of the many, one of the myriad things about Kelly that makes her the perfect match for me is that she's not only indulgent of my love of superheroes and superhero mm -hmm. figures and things, she's encouraging of it. She feeds it, which is a which is just again one of uh, more blessings than I can count. And this is one of more blessings than I can count too. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for, I mean, I'm sorry, I've gone 10 minutes over your allotted time, but. Oh, no, this is perfect. I, I feel Kelly is really the woman who um, made, you, made you feel heard. Mm. And, mm, and I'm gonna good. end this today's show with this. <laughs> Bravo. Well played. I know you would appreciate that. Thank you so much, Gary, for coming to the show. I'm have such a great time to have you on today. Thank well, you. Th yes, thank you for having me. And, 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 and beyond that, more than that, thank you for um, uh, inspiring me, uh, being my friend. Uh, and I, I hope we can continue to uh, have that friendship grow deeper. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All well, right. that's it, folks. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.